Good evening, Lomax. Good evening, Lomax family and friends. Thank you. I like that response. We're going to begin this sacred season and tonight's worship with a very special treat because we have a guest psalmist. Her name is Mary Johnson, and she is from Glen Ridge Seventh-day Adventist Church in Capitol Heights, Maryland. So sit back and prepare to get ready for a very, very special worship experience. And welcome, Ms. Johnson, to uh, Lomax. Amen? Man, if God woke you up this morning, say amen. If he woke you up in your right mind and you had the activity of your limbs, let's say amen. The Bible tells us in Psalms 34, oh, magnify the Lord with, with me and let us exalt his name together. Amen. So that means we're going to do all of this together. Amen. 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 I shared, a, if, if I have your permission to do so, I have a brief testimony that I shared with my brother with regard to this first song that we're doing. It's the song by C.C. Winans that says, Believe For It. Um, on Friday, this coming Friday, at some time during that day, I'll be going to closing on a house. Praise the Lord. I'm believing for it. This journey started in early February. I'm giving you the Reader's Digest version of this testimony because God has orchestrated everything in this process in that um, when they requested the verification of employment and your pay stubs and all of that stuff, I found a glaring error, and that was that they paid me lower than what I was supposed to be paid. But God knows what he's doing, what the devil meant for bad, God meant for good, because that money was going towards my closing. And God has a way of orchestrating things in the way that we don't even have a clue as to what's going on and we we have to learn how to lean on him and um, ask God to help us to remove the obstacles out of our way so that we can believe for it that we can believe for the blessing that God is going to have for us and so um, all my monies have come in today <laughs> today I'm thanking the Lord. I believe for it. At first, I was getting ready to say, you know, I don't even want to do this. I'm getting tired of this. I don't want to do it. And my daughter told me, she said, Mom, I know you didn't come this far and put all this money out thus far to just give up on this. Just believe for it. So this song I've been playing, it's been resonating with me. And I said, you know, Lord, you have an amazing way of reassuring me that everything's going to be all right. He's saying, I got this. You don't have to worry about it. He said, I'm doing a new thing with you. So praise the Lord with me tonight, everybody. Put your hands together. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Don't it sound good? Don't it sound good? Amen. Amen. They say this mountain can't be moved. They say these chains will never break. But they don't know you like I do. There is power in your name. We heard that there is no way through. We've heard the tide will never change. They haven't seen what you can do. There is power in your name. So much power in your name. Move the unmovable, break the unbreakable. see a miracle 
Now I know this part for sure. We know that hope is never lost. Oh, for there is still an empty grave. God, we believe no matter what, there is power in your name. So much power. said you you said it I believe it you said it God it's done it's done whatever that situation you're going through that you ask God about to deliver you from perhaps it's a sickness perhaps it's a wayward child perhaps it's an unforgiving spouse whatever it is God can fix that but you have to believe that he can do it and he can do exceedingly abundantly above all that we can even begin to think or imagine. Amen? Amen. Amen. The song says, you said it. I believe it. You said it. It's done. Turn to your neighbor and tell him, God said it. I believe it. God said it. It's done. God said it. I believe it. God said it. It is not this side, let's sing.
Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord, everyone. Aren't we glad that we have Miss Mary Johnson here with us tonight just to open us up, to liven us up, and to remind us that if God said it and we believe it, it is done. Amen. Because our God is a good God. I want to welcome all who have come out tonight to be a part of this opening night of our Lenten worship experience. How many of you are so happy that we are able to worship together during the Lenten season? And for those who couldn't gather in the sanctuary, we thank you for joining us in worship from your home locations, whether it's by phone, whether it's by tablet, whether it's by computer. We are all worshiping together. We are feeling the presence of the Lord wherever we are. Somebody say amen. And now we're going to open with our opening prayer. Would you bow your heads with me? Dear God, we thank you for another opportunity to gather to worship you. We thank you for this very holy season, this Lenten season. We thank you for allowing us to devote ourselves to worship and to community service. We ask that you would be with us in this place and other places wherever we have gathered to be a part of this service. We ask that you would pour out your Holy Spirit amongst all who have gathered to worship you tonight. Help us to receive all that is given by song, by the word, by the reading of the scripture, by a testimony. We thank you, God. We honor you. And we just ask that you would have your way tonight in this service. This is your servant's prayer. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. There's nothing like an opening song to unite us. And I'm going to ask everybody, as you can, to please stand to join in our opening hymn which is one that we should all sing. We should already know. We shouldn't need the lyrics to be displayed. Oh, how I love Jesus. How many people in here tonight love Jesus? I mean, you love him with your whole heart. Amen. If you love Jesus, sing this song like you love Jesus. Amen.
next to you or sitting next to you and say, oh, how I love Jesus. Say it like you mean it. Amen. 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 You may be seated. And tonight I will be sharing with you our scripture lesson, which if you have your Bible, please turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. And I'll be reading in your hearing from verses 18 through 31. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 18 through 31. Hear ye the words of the Lord. I'm reading from the New Revised Standard Version. And it's entitled, Christ, the Power and Wisdom of God. Hear ye the words of the Lord. For the message about the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? It has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, God decided through the foolishness of our proclamation to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs and Greeks desire wisdom, but we proclaim Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. But to those who are the called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God, for God's foolishness is wiser than human wisdom, and God's weakness is stronger than human strength. Consider your own call, brothers and sisters. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, things that are not, to reduce to nothing things that are, so that no one might boast in the presence of God. He is the source of your life in Christ Jesus, who became for us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption in order that as it is written let the one who boast boast in the lord say that with me let the one that boast boast in the lord may god bless the reading hearing doing of his holy word and now we're going to receive a video moment of reflection following which we will be blessed again by a selection by our guest psalmist, Miss Mary Johnson, from it's the Glen Ridge Seventh-day Adventist and Church. Again. And then following that selection, the same. we will be blessed to receive and I'm our word for tonight. I'm running through the forest. Pastor, the moon isn't bright enough. The branches cut my arms. Amen. I don't know which way I'm going. I, I just know something is behind me. Something evil. So I run. It's bone chilling cold. I just want to wake up from this dream. To find shelter. But there is none. To find light. But it's only dark. Then through the desolation. I feel hope. And as I get closer, I sense him waiting for me, his heart open. So I fall shaking, shivering into the Father's presence. He lets me stay there. He tells me everything is okay. There's nothing chasing me any longer. I am safe in my God. Eventually, he will release me and put me back in the world. But it won't be the same. Because 
he will be there with me forever. The way campfire smoke stays on my clothes. The way the touch of my childhood blanket could bring me back to a safe place. The way I'll never forget how to find my way home. Because he is my home. He is my refuge. I am protected. I am rescued. I have been through the dark night of the forest and I have found my way back. And he will never let me go. Amen. As Sister Johnson prepares to come, I want to share with you all that I wasn't anticipating preaching this evening. At 4.30, I got a text message from Pastor Hostin to say that his entire family has been sick all week, and he got the bug, and he has fever and everything else going on. So I would ask you to pray for me so that I can provide the word that God has sent, because I don't believe God makes mistakes. And so I think God knew this was coming. Um, I had a sermon that I hadn't preached, and now I know why, and God knew. So I'm gonna ask you to pray for me as Sister Johnson comes, and then we'll hear from the Lord. the 
king and you're invited to come and to this sign to worry this time but now I call you're the king and you're just read one verse of scripture out of 1 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 31. It's the scripture that Dr. Hargrove had you emphasize. Let the one who boasts boast in the Lord. Let the one who boasts boast in the Lord. Let us pray. God, you are the king of glory. And so we invite you now to come into this preaching moment. We need you, Lord, because we came to hear a word from you tonight to take us a little farther on our Lenten journey. So I pray, God, now that you would allow me to totally decrease, that you might increase. I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart would be acceptable unto thee. For Lord, you are my strength and my redeemer. And it's in Christ's name I pray. Let everyone say, amen. Let me begin with a term that I think that youth and young adults are still using today. The term is flexing. Now, it may not be a part of our normal vocabulary, but UrbanDictionary.com says that flexing means to brag or to show off. And today, Paul, in the text that we just read, writes about boasting. To flex is to boast. Now, most of us understand that term flex to relate to what a bodybuilder often does. When a bodybuilder lifts weights, they often want to show off their muscles, and so they flex. It's a way of them bragging about what they've done. But people flex about all kinds of things. We flex about how much money we make. We flex about how many males or females that we can pull. We flex about how many degrees or titles we have. There are all kinds of things that we flex about. Well, in our text for today, Paul ends in verse 31 with these words. Therefore, as the scripture says, if you want to boast, 
boast only about the Lord. For our purposes this evening, let's update Paul's language a little bit and say, if you want to flex, flex only about the Lord. And so for this evening's message, I'd ask you to consider the topic, Flexing Fools for Christ. Flexing Fools for Christ. 1 Corinthians is one of Paul's letters to those in the church in Corinth. Paul is writing to a particular group of people at a particular time. Something was going on that caused Paul to, to write 1 Corinthians. And something was going on that caused him to write this particular part of the letter to the Corinthians, where his focus was on the need for us to be fools for Christ. To understand that the only thing we should be flexing about is Jesus Christ. So what was going on with the people who made up the Corinthian church? The belief is that at the time when Paul wrote his letter, those in the church had to do their own thing because they were always worrying about their status. They were worrying about what some would say their street credibility their credentials, as the young people would say. They were always worried about what other people thought about them. There were those in the Corinthian church who were wealthy, but most of those who were in the Corinthian church were not wealthy nor socially prominent. Most of the Corinthians really had no street cred, as they would say. You know a desire, uh, you know a desire to make it, can cause you to try to do things that you wouldn't normally do. When you want to go from a lower place in people's viewpoint in society, you will do a lot of things to try to elevate yourself so that you can have some street cred. You will do things that have nothing to do with who you are or who God created you to be, who Jesus Christ wants you to be. And so we're to be reminded that in Psalm 15, according to the Message Bible, God says that if we want to spend all of eternity with him, we must walk straight, act right, tell the truth, don't hurt your friend, don't blame your neighbor, don't des despise the despicable, keep your word even when it costs you, make an honest living, and never take a bribe. That's what Psalm 15 says that we got to do if we want to make it to heaven. Sometimes we lose our way. It's not that we don't know what it means to be a follower of Christ. It's not that we don't know what Christ requires us to do. But sometimes in the midst of living, in the midst of trying to advance, to move forward, in the, in the midst of trying to come up from where we think we are to where we think we should be, we try to please people and we try to make friends with people and we sometimes get lost when what we should be trying to do is be a follower of Jesus Christ. And so Paul, at the very beginning of his letter, makes clear to the Corinthians, you need to go back to the basics. You need to go back to the beginning of our faith and understand what the church was founded on. And Paul wants them to understand it is that they are to be fools for Christ. And if you're going to flex about anything, then you better flex about Christ. Paul was challenging the Corinthians and us to be flexing fools for Christ. Paul begins in verse 18 saying, The message of the cross is foolishness to those who are headed for destruction. But we who are being saved know it is the very power of God. Paul makes it clear in this section of his letter that there are two camps that you can fall into. You're either in the camp of those who are headed for destruction or you're in the camp of those who are trying to be saved. What camp do we find ourselves in on this first Wednesday in Lent? What camp are we a part of? Take a moment and reflect on your own life and where you are. Who do you spend time with? What do you do when, when people are looking at you and when they're not looking at you? How are you living your life? Are you living saved day by day? Or are you only saved when you think somebody's watching you? Are you headed for destruction? Or are you headed for a life with Christ through the cross? Paul says that the message of the cross is foolishness if we're headed for destruction. But it's the very power of God if we are being saved. 
So what is the message of the cross? The message of the cross is that Christ died for our sins and the sins of the whole world and that he was resurrected on the third day and that he's coming back again. If that message is vital for your life, then perhaps you are being saved day by day. But if Christ's death and resurrection and his return are really not that important to you, then perhaps you're heading for destruction. We're called to be fools for Christ. We are fools for other people all the time. We let people make fools of us all the time, running after foolish people, doing foolish things. But how many of us run after God in a way that we're willing to be fools for Christ? That I don't care what you say about me. I don't care what you think about me. I love Christ that much that I'm willing to be a fool for Christ. The camp that we are in, folks, is it's not set in stone. It's, a, it's an ongoing process. We can start out in the camp where we're trying to find Christ, and then we can get distracted by stuff and find ourselves going in the direction of destruction. We stop by today to remind us that we've always got to be on a journey where we're trying to find Christ Jesus. We've always got to be on a journey where we are trying to make sure that we are a fool for Christ even if it means that we got to reject some things in the world, even if it means that we've got to reject some people in the world, even if it means that we got to reject some things that everybody else is doing, we've got to learn that we've got to be a fool for Christ. Because I'm telling you, I don't want to be in the camp of destruction. I don't want to go through all of this and find out at the end that I was not doing what I was supposed to do because I find myself in a place of destruction, separated from God. I don't know about you, but that scares me, that there's a possibility that I can go through the motions. I can stand up here and preach Sunday after Sunday. You can serve Sunday after Sunday. You can play Sunday after Sunday. And when it's all said and done and Christ comes back, he says, I don't know you. You weren't doing it for me. You were doing it for you. You wanted everybody to see how well you sing. You wanted everybody to see what kind of hats you wore all the time. You wanted everybody to think that you could quote scripture all the time. You weren't doing it for me. You were doing it for yourself. And so Paul says that we've got to understand what camp that we're in. And we've got to always to strive for that camp. Church, we're talking about flexing for Christ today. Like I said earlier, bodybuilders walk around flexing all the time, showing off the hours of the hard work that they put in at the gym, which gives them muscles popping out of everywhere, as well as the ability to lift a whole lot of weights. The power of God that is available to us is if we spend time with God in prayer, in the scriptures, in fasting and in worship, the power of God that is available to us is as a result of the hard work of staying in relationship with God. The power of God ought to be at work in our lives. You heard this sister give her testimony about the house that she's believing she's about to close on on Friday. Some of us don't walk in faith. We don't believe that God can do anything. We kind of tiptoe around faith. I kind of believe. I I'm not sure. I try to dot on my I's and cross on my T's. I got an escape route in case things don't go the right way. How many of us are bold in our beliefs about what God has told us he can do for us, not what we've told ourselves? I believe that God told her that she was going to get this house, and she believed. What has God told you that you won't step in faith and believe? We all should be able to flex when God shows up in our life and he does some stuff that, that nobody said was possible in our life. When we've got bad credit and we still get the loan. When we aren't qualified and we still get the job. When things happen in our life that can only happen because God is the one who showed up in our lives. When Paul talks about the message of the cross in verse 18, Paul is talking about what Jesus did on the cross. You see, before Jesus' death and resurrection, as one commentary notes, the cross was a symbol of shame and humiliation and rejection. We have to understand that we walk around with crosses on and some of us have crosses in our homes and we have crosses in our church and they've become crosses as symbols 
of good things, of resurrection and of power. But when Jesus was on the cross, it was a shameful, humiliating place to be. But how many of you know that only the power of Jesus Christ can take shame and humiliation and flip it around and turn it into something that's good and gives God glory? That what Christ experienced on the cross is what he wants you to experience in your life. Whatever the shame is that the world would want you to walk in, when we walk in the power of Jesus Christ, then we ought to walk in the power knowing that whatever shame you're trying to put on me, my God will flip it right on you and I will be elevated and I will be exalted and I will give God the glory. We've got to understand that that is what the power of the cross is all about. It becomes a symbol of victory. It becomes a symbol of resurrection. It becomes a symbol of hope. We should be flexing about what it is that the cross means to us generally as Christians, but we ought to have a flex for ourselves. You ought to have your own testimony that's your own flex about who you used to be and who you are now and that it was nothing but God that could do it for you. How many of you all used to spend windy nights in church? And look at you now, in church on a Wednesday night, late at night when you'd rather be at home, probably in your bed, watching TV, doing something else, drinking some tea, whatever it may be. But you're here on a Wednesday night because God is moving in your life. I hope you're not here because I asked you to be here. I hope you're not here because we opened the doors of the church. I hope you're here because you love Jesus that much and he's done something for you in your life. And so you come in to worship him and flex and say, I serve a good God. And because I serve a good God, I'm willing to come up here and worship God on a Wednesday night. You see, there's a whole world out there that's not in the church on a Wednesday night headed for destruction. We can be out there headed for destruction or whether you're online and tuned in, you could be doing other things, but we are here because of who Christ is. Paul wants us to understand that we are called to be fools for Christ, which is contrary to what the world tells us. He goes on as he quotes some parts of Isaiah and he says in verse 19, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and discard the intelligent of the intelligent. We are encouraged to get education. I'm about tired of school, right? Any of y'all tired of school? We all try to get an education if we're able to. But Paul wants us to understand, don't get it twisted. Just because you have a bachelor's, a master's, a doctorate, post-doctorate, you're a doctor, you're everything, you got all these letters behind your name. He wants us to understand that the wisdom of the world is nothing if we don't have the wisdom of Christ. You can be the most agreed fool in the whole world. He wants us to be those who are fools for Christ and degrees don't make us people who have wisdom. We're just people who have some knowledge. And there's a difference between knowledge and Christ, and knowledge and wisdom. And so he wants us to understand that we've got to learn how to be a fool for Christ. So what does it mean to be a fool for Christ? A fool for Christ loves their enemies, right? The people who get on your nerves, you know they're here, they might even be in this room right now. They get on your nerves, but you still love them. Why? Because Christ loved you. And Christ could say, you get on my nerves too. But he still loves you, right? So a fool for Christ loves their enemies. A fool for Christ gives their money to the poor. Even though they might scam you. Even though you don't know what they're going to do with your quarter that you give them. You still give it to them because God has given to you. And the world may say, you're a fool for giving that man money that woman money. But you do it because you're a fool for Christ and you don't know whether Christ is gonna come back to you and say, when did you feed me? When did you clothe me? When did you love me? And so we do foolish things that people in the traffic say, I can't believe he rolled down his window and gave him a dollar. I do it because Christ told me to do it. It may be foolish, but I'm willing to be a fool for Christ. We have to be fools who are willing to decrease who we are to allow Christ to increase in us, right? When I was in school, y'all, I used to love to kind of wear somewhat flashy clothes, right? Not tacky, but flashy, right? 
I used to wear some stuff that had some color in it, right? Brother Ray will tell you when he came into the ministry, what did I tell him? Blue, black, brown. Blue, black, gray. Blue, black, brown. Blue, black, gray. I'd rather put on a little flash every once in a while, but I have to understand that I've got to die unto who I want to be so that you all aren't looking up here at my clothes going, mm, look at what he has on. And you can't even hear the word of God that's coming forward. Do I want to wear black all the time? No, I don't. But I've got to decrease. What are the things that we like to do that de need to decrease in us so that what Christ is calling us to do can increase? We've got to be a fool for Christ. We've got to be a fool for Christ in every situation. We've got to have people who look at us and say, he is a fool, right? Take it as a badge of honor. She's a fool that she goes around visiting people. She's a fool that she goes around making soup for people. She's a fool that she goes and takes seniors to their doctor's appointments. You're retired now. Do you? Why are you running around doing all this other stuff? Because I have been called to do the things that I've been called to do. And you might not understand why I do it, but I don't care what you understand. I do what Christ calls me to do because I need to be a fool for Christ. People, I need to get real with you. There is so much foolishness that's going on in the world today that sometimes I really just want to get off the train. I just really want to say, God, it's time to go. Because I know that our age often impacts how much foolishness we see on the internet. The younger people, you all have no idea what they're going through. What the stuff is that they're exposed to on the internet, it is demonic. And they are inundated with it all day long. And it is killing their very spirits. But we all are inundated with a bunch of foolishness in this world. And we've got to understand that we've got to learn how to shut out the foolishness of the world so that we can be in tune with what it is that God would want us to understand. And so Paul says the message of the cross is simple. It is Christ crucified. That is the message of the cross. All the other stuff we do is supposed to amplify the message, but the message is simple. Christ was crucified for you and for me. Christ died because I was a filthy wretch. Christ got up so that I would have eternal life. Christ is coming back and we should have hope in every situation. Christ crucified is the message. And so we have to choose which way will we go? Will we take the way of the cross? Or will we take the way of the world? Every day that's a question that we have to ask ourselves. Will I engage in the way of the cross? Or will I engage in the way of the world? And I'm here to tell you that there are people watching you who know you come to church, who know you call yourself a Christian, and they want to see whether or not you'll choose the way of the cross or will you choose the way of the world. And we have to understand that the way of the cross is not always easy. The way of Christ says that sex is between married folks. The way of the world says if it feels good, do it. The way of the cross says that our bodies are a temple. The way of the world says it's my body and I can do what I want with it. The way of the cross says that the last shall be first and the first shall be last. The way of the world says whoever dies with the most toys wins. The way of Christ says that you should love God with everything that you have within you. The way of the world says there is no God, so love yourself. That's all you have. The way of the cross says, love your neighbor as much as you love yourself. The way of the world says, love yourself, period. Don't worry about anybody else. The way of the cross says, turn the other cheek. The way of the world says, slap them in both cheeks as hard as you can. The way of the cross says, your weakness makes you strong. The way of the world says, never let them see you sweat. And so Paul says, in verse 28 of our text, God chose the things despised by the world, things counted as nothing at all, 
and used them to bring to nothing what the world considered important. What Paul is talking about here, he's talking about Jesus. Paul is talking about how God chose a boy born to an unwed mother who came from a city where people thought nothing good could come from and made him the savior of the world. Paul is talking about how God took one from the outside of the religious establishment to teach and bring those in order who were inside the religious establishment. Paul is talking about how God took one who was falsely accused, who was wrongly convicted, who was brutally murdered, who was transformed into one that you could barely recognize, into one who was divinely vindicated, triumphant, resurrected, and eternally glorified. That's what our God can do. Paul is talking about a God who took one who was viewed as being weak and demonstrated that he had more power than any other human or God that ever existed. Paul is saying that this is what we should be flexing about. Not how long you've been a member of the church. Not how long you've served. Not what positions you have. Not that you're the senior pastor. Not that you're ordained. But what you flex about is Jesus Christ. That's the only thing if you're going to boast. That's the only thing that you should flex about. God has united us with Christ Jesus. We ought to flex about the fact that we're united to Christ and not to the evil one. We ought to be able to flex about the fact that through Christ, we all have wisdom. Whether we've been to college or any other kind of school, that we all have wisdom by the power of the Holy Spirit. So I want to flex about it. Christ gives us so many things to flex about. The fact that his blood covers a multitude of sins. I want to flex about the fact that I don't have to stay in my sin sick self and that God will cover me by his blood. We ought to flex about a God who is pure and holy. And because he is holy, we are trying to be holy by the power of Christ. We ought to flex about the fact that we are freed from sin. Not that we're not sinners, but that we are freed from it and that we can't be delivered from it. There is so much to flex about in Christ Jesus. Don't flex about your bank balance. Flex about your blessing balance. Don't flex about your family name. Flex that your name is in, written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Don't flex about the neighborhood that you live in or you're trying to get in. Flex about the city whose architect and builder is God and that he's got a house for you there with your name on it. Flex about the things that God has done and will do in your life. I'd like to end with this. Now, I've never been a bodybuilder, but I do know this. That when you go to the meets where they compete, the first thing they do before they get there is they fast. They don't eat because they want all their muscles to show as they're strutting around, right? They want it all to see for everyone. They deny themselves worldly pleasures. As we're going through this Lenten season, how about you try fasting for a little while? so that some things can begin to pop out in your life that you wouldn't normally see. So that you can begin to see some definition in your spiritual life about what you need to do and what God needs to do through you and what God has already done through you. So I want you to fast. The second thing that they do is they lift a whole bunch of weight. You have to stress your muscles in order for it to grow. I'm calling on somebody in this period of Lent to not only fast, but to exercise your faith. If there's something that God has told you to do and you don't believe that you're really qualified to do it, lift that weight up and go ahead and try it. Because if you believe in who God is, you ought to be able to believe that you have the faith for God to do it through you. And then the third thing that they do is they fast, they lift weights, and then they cover themselves in oil. You know, they put that oil and they rub it all over themselves so they're glistening. The reason they do that is so you can see the definition in their muscles. Well, well, for us as Christians, oil is representative of the Holy Spirit. And I'm calling on you during this season, operate in the Holy Spirit every day that you have during this period of Lent. 
Ask the spirit to move and have its way and to anoint you and to anoint your life. And I'm here to tell you, if you will believe that the Holy Spirit will do some things in your life, I believe that just like if you were at a bodybuilding competition, at the end of this Lenten period, I'm going to see some of y'all walk around the stage doing like this. Look at what my God has done for me. God told me to do this, and I didn't think I could do it. But look what God has done. I didn't think I could give up smoking, but I did it for 40 days. Look what God has done. I didn't think I could give up Diet Coke. Help me, God. But I could do it with the power of God. I didn't think I could love somebody who gets on my last nerves, but ha, look at God. I can do all things through Christ Jesus who strengthens me. So I'm calling you during the slitting season. Stop boasting about stuff that don't matter. Flex about who God is as we go through this season, about how good he's been to you, about what he's doing in your life. Some of us are just too reserved about God. I don't know where we got it from. I don't know where we thought being sophisticated makes you holy. But if God has done something for you, you ought to be able to give him praise. You ought to be able to tell somebody. You ought to be able to lift up a holy hand. You ought to be able to clap. You ought to be able to shout. You may even speak in tongues. But you've got to give God the glory. And so as we start this Lenten season, I pray that we have some flexors up in here. Don't worry about being ladylike. Don't worry about being austere. Flex if God has done something good in your life because you know what it does? When you flex, somebody else can see what's going on in your life and somebody might want to know the God that you're flexing about. So I'm calling you to be a flexing fool for Christ. Amen? Amen. Amen. Oh, Lord, you have a sense of humor. Before we pray, I have to just confess this. Today I went to go give communion to Sister Patillo. And she said, before you sit down, Pastor, I need to give you something. And she went in the kitchen and she came out and she had an ice cold Diet Coke. <laughs> and she said, Pastor, I, I heard you in one of your sermons say that you like Diet Cokes and potato chips. She said, so I thought I would get this Diet Coke for you. Now, earlier in the week, I told Reverend Tina that I'd been praying about trying to give up Diet Coke. And I said, but you know what? When I had my procedure last Wednesday, when I came out of the anesthesia, they told you what was your choice to drink. And I said, do you have a diet soda? They said, yes, we have diet soda. I had a diet Coke. I said, well, that was Ash Wednesday. It's too late for me to try to give it up now. She was like, no, it's not too late for you to give it up. I say that to say that if we haven't started whatever it is that God is telling us to do, even though we're already a weekend, it's never too late to start. It's never too late to start doing what God has told you you need to do. And so you all will be my accountability partners. If you see me with a Diet Coke, y'all pray over me because I am convicted now that I've got to show myself that I can give this up during this period because I believe that God can do all things through Christ Jesus. Pray with me. God, we thank you for this season to walk along with you towards Calvary, a season of reflection and a season of repentance, a season of renewal, and a season, as Reverend Polite preached about, of recalibration. It's a chance for us to try to do better and to live by your example. And so God, you've reminded us on today that we have so much to flex about but it requires us to do some things ourselves. Perhaps we need to fast. Perhaps we need to have more faith. Perhaps we need to have the favor of God in our lives by the presence of the Holy Spirit. So God, we pray that this word will not go forth void and that it'll root itself in your people and that God, we will be better for it. God, if there's one under the sound of my voice who 
is here tonight, but you've never accepted this Christ. You don't know what Jesus can do for you. You've never said that you believe he's the son of God and that he died for you and that he was raised on the third day and that he's coming back. And why not make Lent the season where you give your life to Christ? If that's you, all you need to do is let us know that you want to be saved and we'll pray with you. And then if you're here and the thing you know you need to do is get attached to a branch of Zion and you want to become a member of Lomax, if that's you, our arms are wide open to receive you. All you have to do is come and let us know. So God, we thank you for this opportunity to worship you. And we pray, God, that we will be better for it. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Let everyone say, amen. As the, minister, as the music ministry plays softly, if there's one that needs to come today, come for salvation. Perhaps you just need to come to the altar and just pray for yourself as you go through this Lenten journey. If that's you, the altar is open. Just come and pray and you can return to your seats when your soul is satisfied. And if you're looking for a church home, the doors of the church are open for you. Is there one that will come this evening? Don't wait for anybody else to move. You do what you need to do. The altar is open. Our arms are open.
Again, thank you, Sister Johnson, for blessing us so wonderfully. I hope this is not the last time we will see you. Amen. Brother Terry, thank you for being available on tonight and always using your gifts in the way that you do. Let us receive the benediction and then we will stand for the extinguishing of the candles. A flex and fool for Christ. And now unto him who was able to keep you from falling, unto him who was able to present you before the presence of his throne with exceedingly great joy, to the all-wise God be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forevermore. And let the people of God say, Amen. prepare to leave just by way of commercial and preview if the Lord has his way next week our presiding elder will be our preacher and members of the George Mason University Gospel Choir will provide our music amen, amen. so tell a friend and invite them out and thank you to the members of class 2 and 15 for being here amen, amen.